Well, after after so many lectures, I could imagine that you're already a little bit exhausted processing all these uh, theories and this uh, difficult stuff. So um, I try not to go into too much theoretical detail in this uh, lecture, but I but I can afford to do so because uh, all the previous lectures has have pretty well. Uh, laid the theoretical foundation of, of many of the things that I'm going to present. So as you see from the title of the lecture, uh, I will talk about something uh, that we call GWT self-energy. Just a second, I take the laser pointer here. Uh, GWT self-energy, and this is a rather recent uh, development. It's an extension of the GW approximation for magnetic systems. So you have already learned about the GW approximation in yesterday's talk by Matteo Gatti. And he told you that with GW, we uh, treat the interactions of electrons with plasmons. So generally with a density fluctuations of which the plasmon is the fundamental uh, energy quantum. But in ferromagnets, um, you have, and generally in magnetic systems, in particular in ferromagnets, um, you have another fundamental class of many body excitations, and these are the magnons. Magnons are the uh, energy quantum of those excitations, and these are the spin excitations. And um, the question that one could ask is, Perhaps this kind of scattering also plays a role similar to the electron plasmon scattering for magnetic materials. And in fact, there is experimental evidence that this is so. So here you see some uh, results, some, some experimental measurements so from photo emission spectroscopy. For example, one sees that there is a very strong spin asymmetry in the lifetime broadening of the spectra. Um, for example, in this uh, measurement, but also nicely uh, seen in this very recent measurements, yet unpublished by uh, colleagues in Jülich, Eva Blünschek and Lukas Pruczynski, and they measured uh, the photo emission spectrum of uh, iron, and they see that the majority bands uh, broaden very quickly below the Fermi energy, the Fermi energy is here, and they broaden so much that they practically disappear pretty soon below the Fermi energy, whereas the spin down electrons, the other spin direction, uh, those states are still pretty well seen to large binding energy. So there seems to be a very strong difference in the, uh, in the scattering between spin up and spin down. Uh, there is another uh, observation, namely, uh, one sees band anomalies in the band dispersion of magnetic materials. Uh, for example, in this, um, in this measurement by Schäfer et al. 2004, they saw a kink structure right below the Fermi energy. And since this kink uh, is energetically located as a typical magnon energy, they conjectured that this comes from electron magnon scattering, although there has not been any proof for that so far. And very recently, there has been another um, uh, measurement. And uh, in this photo emission uh, measurement, they, they saw a king structure at a much higher binding energy, 1.5 EV. You see this, this uh, zigzag line of the band dispersion in a bin, spin down band of iron. Well, since this is at a, at a quite large binding energy, it might be questionable that this can come from electron magnon scattering, but we'll see later on. Um, I would like to come back very briefly to this first um, issue of the lifetime broadening, because usually in, in GW, one rather speaks about band renormalizations. One does not talk so much about the broadening of lines. Now, the, the broadening of lines is related to uh, the lifetime of an excitation. 
So suppose you take out an electron from your system, so you create a hole in your system, then from a physical point of view, one would expect that this hole is very soon filled by another electron, which falls into the hole, and then the hole ceases to exist. Well, would this happen in Korn sham DFT? No, because the Korn sham states are stationary states. They are infinitely long lived. But it does happen in theories which describe explicitly the electron electron interaction. And for example, in GW, in GW, we get also the lifetime broadenings in this way. And uh, the lifetime broadening is, of course, just um, an effect of the um, uh, energy, energy time uncertainty. So I've already said it. So GW should be able to describe a lifetime effect. So let us have a look whether GW could explain this very different uh, lifetime broadening between spin up and spin down. No, it does not. You see here a GW calculation for iron spin up channel, spin down channel. It, the red lines are just the DFT calculation and this um, a color plot is the GW calculation. So you do see a lifetime broadening. The lines get broadened, broadened uh, um, more strongly the further you go away from the Fermi energy. Simply it's then, you know, the deeper the hole is, the more likely it is that it is filled by another electron. Uh, but we do see also that uh, there might be some difference in the lifetime broadening, but it definitely cannot describe the very big difference that we've seen uh, in the photo emission spectrum. So there must be another scattering process responsible for that. Uh, yeah, okay, and this was the photo emission spectrum that I have already shown on the previous slide. So after this motivation, I show you briefly uh, the overview of the talk. So in order to uh, construct the GWT self-energy, we first have to have a way to calculate the many body spin excitations. And that's the first part of the talk. We do that by calculating the transverse mag magnetic response function or gener more generally the T matrix. And this is done with the beta psi beta equation Francesco has introduced the beta psi beta equation in his talk this morning about the optical absorption. A similar uh, equation can be used for the magnetic response function. I will very briefly uh, say a few words about the implementation. We use a, a set of Bunyan functions there. And then I'll show some results for transition metal ferromagnets, namely iron and nickel. Uh, I guess we won't have time then to talk about this issue here. There is a certain violation of a physical constraint. So if I have time at that point, I might mention it briefly. Um, and then we come to the second part of the talk where we use the information that we obtain in the first part to construct a, um, a self energy that describes both the electron plasmon and the electron magnon scattering in our system. And we do so by a systematic iteration of Hedin's equations. Or I should say it's rather motivated by this uh, uh, iteration. And then I show results for iron. Um, I, I show a comparison also to experiment and to a DMFT calculation, uh, which is another method that can treat strong correlations. Then we'll talk about lifetime broadenings, renormalizations and band anomalies. There is another violation again of a physical constraint that uh, I probably will not have time to talk about, but perhaps I will have. Uh, let's see. And uh, in the end, well, even if we can improve the spectral functions, we still have to make sure that if we improve one thing, we should not worsen another thing. For example, we know that from DFT, we get pretty good uh, descriptions of magnetic moments, D bandwidth and exchange splitting. And we, we have to see whether GWT also improves on that or perhaps worsens the agreement with experiment. And in the end, I give the conclusions. Okay, let's start uh, with the magnetic response function. Um, 
try to minimize it. Uh, no, I can't do it, sorry. I would like to minimize this uh, video. Okay. So the magnetic response function. Um, you see, it's a quite complicated or complex quantity, which is not surprising because what is the magnetic response function? That is uh, the response function of the spin density uh, with respect to changes of the external B field. But of course, the spin density is a vectorial quantity. We have uh, sigma x, sigma y, sigma z. Also, the external B field is a vector vectorial quantity. So we must have Bx, By, Bz. And this gives us already a three by three matrix of response functions. But it turns out that we also have to uh, take into account the external potential and uh, the full electronic density. Because if we change the external potential, this can have an effect on the spin density and likewise, um, changing the external B field, B field can have an effect on the total density. And uh, in particular, we also have then here the density response function uh, that Francesco talked about and that you need for calculating optical absorption. Now that looks rather complicated, but we can luckily uh, simplify it a lot. The first step is that we neglect spin orbit coupling. Spinomic coupling is, of course, a topic that also has to do with spins. And uh, there is an interesting also interesting development together with GW that I could talk about, but I'm not going to talk about that. So for the rest of the talk, I will neglect spin orbit coupling. And then if we do that, then uh, the full um, magnetic response function uh, becomes block diagonal. The lower block contains the density response function here. So this lower block rather describes higher energy excitations that we are not so interested in. We'd rather um, uh, describe the low energy excitations because those are more likely to change the uh, electronic structure close to the Fermi energy. So we will um, focus on this higher block, which can further be simplified by a coordinate transformation from Bx, By into B plus, B minus, and uh, in the case of the B field, these would describe a circularly polarized B fields. And uh, we have two of them because we have two senses of rotation. Uh, the I would be the phase shift of 90 degrees. So it's really a circular polarization. And we do this uh, coordinate transformation also for the spin density. And in this way, also this upper block becomes block uh, becomes diagonal. And if we define uh, the uh, majority spin to point in the positive z direction, then this magnetic response function would describe uh, the many body spin excitations. For example, the spin waves. Um, so I guess you see me in the, in the video, suppose you have uh, the spins all pointing in the positive Z direction, they are aligned due to exchange interaction. Now you, you uh, tilt one spin a little bit, you perturb one spin, uh, then due to the exchange interaction, the next neighboring spin will also feel this perturbation. So you, you kick this one, then this one will be kicked and so on. So you have a spin wave propagating through your um, ordered spin system, and that can be drawn in terms of this uh, spin wave. Um, yes, but there is also another class of spin excitations that I will uh, that we will um, uncover if we do the full uh, theoretical derivation of the beta cell beta equation. That's basically the beta cell beta equation that you've already seen in the morning on on one in one line. So uh, what we calculate here is, as, as I've said, the magnetic response function, perhaps one word about the notation, we call it R, but th this R is what Francesco calls L, okay? Um, so the magnetic response function is, as, I, as I've said, the change of the spin density with respect to changes in the external B field. Now we reformulate the spin density in terms of a green function. 
And you must have seen that already before. Well, not for the spin density, but for the total density, but it's also possible for the spin density. Uh, the prefactors here are just um, Pauli spin matrices, so they are just constants. And why do we do that? That is simply because if we, instead of using the spin density, we use the green function, then we can use all our machinery from many body perturbation theory. So uh, we construct this functional derivative here, then uh, as a next step, we uh, um, insert the Dyson equation in this form. So uh, G, the in renormalized green function is the inverse of that matrix. And this matrix is the inverse of the non-interacting green function minus the self energy. Matteo Gatti showed you a similar equation that is just uh, written in a different form here. Then you use the chain rule of functional derivatives, which works pretty much like the normal chain rule of normal derivatives. Uh, then we have this equation, uh, this expression. Uh, and then uh, by uh, um, uh, differentiating this term and then this term, we get two terms, of which the first one uh, describes what we call stoner excitations. This is another class of many body spin excitations, or rather single particle spin excitations. Namely, it describes the um, excitation of electrons from the occupied states into the unoccupied states, but it also includes a spin flip. So we go from a spin up state into a spin down state, and that is a genuine spin excitation. Um, the typical uh, energies for this excitation is in the in the range of a band energy, so it is uh, in EV mostly. Um, and this second term then describes the collective excitations, the spin wave excitations, but it also renormalizes the stoner excitations. In this way, the stoner excitations become also many body excitations. So in general, you always have mixtures of stone excitations and spin wave excitations. And perhaps another remark about that um, uh, beta sub theta equation. You see on the right, we, what we want to calculate is the R. You see this R also appears on the right hand side. So if we took the full expression on the right hand side and would uh, stick it into the R in the next iteration, we create three terms. And if we do it again, we create four terms and five terms up to infinite order. So in this way, we get this infinite series of, uh, in this case, ladder diagrams. And why do we have this effect? Well, this is because of, of a feedback effect. So suppose you um, um, apply an external uh, perturbation, a B field, this changes the spin density in your system. But the spin density also creates then an internal B field, which again acts back on the system. And that perturbation again creates another spin uh, change in the spin density and so forth. So this is an infinite series of feedback effects. And that's why you get this infinite series of, of uh, diagrams. And in the same way, you can understand also RPA. It's an infinite series of diagrams due to this feedback effect. And so <clears throat> I have um, just a, a question. Yeah. Um, just to make sure, because since I don't see all the indices, they are wisely hidden uh, not to have a too cumbersome notation. Uh, um, just to be sure. So your G0, what is it? Is it really um, independent particle, G in function? or it contains already some effective uh, uh, interaction? No, the G0 is the uh, non-interacting green function. This is the non-interacting green function that basically, if you apply the self-energy on this particular G0, you get the renormalized G. But this one is the renormalized G. Yeah, OK. And, and here in the renormalized G, so if, if you look at the stoner excitation, does it contain only spin free or the spin free is only a part of it? Since I don't see the spin structure of this first term, GG, is it only two different spins? 
um, it is two different spins. So uh, this one would be G, uh, spin up, for example, this one would be spin down. Um, but of course, you can write it down in an absolutely general way. And then this uh, equation would also cover optical absorption. And you can also write it down in a way that it covers spin orbit coupling. Um, but in this particular situation, in this, in this context that we need it here, uh, the two spin indices of these two uh, green functions would be different. Okay. Uh, spin down or spin down, spin up. Yeah, this is what I want to do. Okay, thank you. Okay, good. And perhaps I should say that uh, Fadi Aryasetjavan and Krista Carlson um, um, suggested to use this formalism to calculate spin excitations. Okay, um, what I've forgotten to say is that the typical energy scale of magnons or, or spin waves uh, are milli EV. Uh, they actually go down to zero EV as long as you do not take into account spin orbit coupling. Um, and they can go up to 100, 200, 300 milli EV. Okay, in order to be able to uh, run calculations, we have to decide what kind of self energy approximation to use. And here I can be very brief because Francesco uh, talked about that already in the morning. So we use the GW self-energy here. We construct this functional derivative. We get two terms of which the second one, in fact, disappears uh, if you don't have spin orbit coupling. In optical absorption, it would not disappear. But in the spin, um, uh, spin response function, it does uh, disappear without spin orbit coupling. Um, OK. And then uh, we can plug this uh, functional derivative in the uh, equation that you've seen on the previous slide. And then we obtain the beta psi beta equation here shown in a very simplified form, just perhaps again about notation. Francesco used L here for this one, and that was L zero. Yeah. Um, and also I should <clears throat> say that the beta psi beta equation for optical absorption has an additional term here in the kernel, uh, but in the spin uh, response function, we do not have the bare Coulomb interaction. We only have the screened Coulomb interaction. And then by plugging in this full expression for the R, uh, successively you can create higher and higher orders of ladder diagrams. Now there comes a difference to the normal treatment of the beta psi beta equation, namely, we do not construct this two particle Hamiltonian and diagonalize that. We rather solve that equation here in real space. And we do that by a projectional representation of each of these vertices in terms of a basis set of Vanya functions. So you see Vanya functions are just linear combinations of single particle eigenstates that are defined in such a way that they are uh, localized. And you see two of two Vanya functions here as an example. So we really treat this R quantity as a four point function, which depends on four points in space. We also do this uh, standard approximation that we take the static limit for the screened interaction. And now we use something that really speeds up the code a lot. Namely, we assume that whenever the electron and the hole interact with each other, they must be on the same atomic site. So we introduce here an on-site approximation and that speeds up the code uh, a lot. <clears throat> uh, everything's implemented in our GW code called specs, FLAW code. Um, and I have to give you now a justification that we actually can use the on-site approximation. And here you see the average uh, matrix element of the screened interaction for the on-site term. And this is the nearest neighbor, next nearest neighbor, and so on. And you see that about 98% of the interaction is really on-site and the nearest neighbor can already be neglected. So for the systems that we're interested in, for these ferromagnets, um, the, the on-site approximation is a good uh, viable approximation. And then let's have a look at the first result. 
This is a calculation for, uh, well, calculation of a spin, um, a magnetic response function. Uh, I should tell you exactly what we see here. So perhaps we go back two slides. So what we calculate here is a four point function. Then in order to be able to plot anything at all, we have to contract these two sides. Then we get a two point function, but still we have very many uh, matrix elements. So what we then do is we project it onto um, the leading um, uh, plane wave from both sides. And that way we obtain the macroscopic part of the magnetic response function. So in this way, we go to get only uh, one function, we plot here the imaginary part of it. And well, the, um, the magnetic response function should have poles right where the Medibody system has its uh, spin excitation energies. And this is what we see here in this color coded plot. So for, for a given Q, we calculate this function by a solution of the beta sal beta equation, for example, for this Q, and then we plot vertically the function that we obtain as a function of frequency or energy. So this is energy and this is uh, the momentum here. Uh, and then we obtain this typical quadratic dispersion of a spin wave. We do this, well, for very many Q points, several hundred, then we get this uh, quadratic dispersion of uh, the spin waves. Here it's shown for iron, but we also see more. So we, we see a lot of lifetime broadening here. The lifetime broadening does not only happen in electronic excitations, but also in spin excitations. And um, apart from uh, the uh, quadratic uh, spin wave dispersion, we see also this grayish background here. In this grayish background, these are the stoner excitations. And the stoner excitations give the fine structure to the spin wave branch. And um, we sometimes have these, these lines here, which look quite uh, strange. And let's have a look at another case. This is now, ah, sorry, I forgot to tell you, uh, we can also compare this to experiments. Uh, this is from neutron scattering, the, the white points, which fall pretty well on the theory curve. But let us have a look at another case, FCC nickel. Here we have a particularly strong uh, stripe feature. What is the stripe feature? Well, this comes, as I've already mentioned, from stoner excitations. Now, suppose you have two sheets of bands, electronic bands, uh, spin up and spin down, um, which more or less have the same dispersion. Then you have very many excitation energies that fall uh, in, in a small energy range. And this is how you get these uh, striped features. So it's a nesting effect of your band structure. And when this uh, stoner band, as I could call it, and the spin wave branch interact, we have another interesting phenomenon, namely what we know from Bloch theory, uh, namely an avoided crossing. So Bloch theory, uh, if you have the electronic bands, when they cross, it can happen that if they interact and you look closer uh, at them, that they actually do not cross. They form an avoided crossing due to the interaction. And a similar thing can happen here, obviously, also for many body states. So here we have a spin wave uh, a branch, which turns into a stoner band by avoided crossing. And here the spin wave branch turns down into the stoner band. Uh, it seems to be interrupted here simply because the magnetic response function needs to, or the imaginary part of it, needs to uh, become zero at the, at the omega equals zero. It's not the Fermi energy, sorry. At omega equals zero. Okay. The solution of the beta sal beta equation, however, gives us much more information. Namely, we actually get this full a four point function. And for the construction of the self energy, we actually need the full four point function. And this is something that I should skip due to time limitations. 
Okay, so let's construct now the self energy. Um, and we do so, or we motivate the construction of the self energy uh, by a systematic iteration of Hedin's equations. Uh, you learned about Hedin's equations in yesterday's talk by Matteo Gatti. Excuse me. On this slide, <clears throat> you see the uh, eight lowest order self energy diagram. So if we iterate Hedin's equations, we can generate higher and higher orders of self energy diagrams. The first order, the lowest order, is the GW self energy. Then you get a second order screen exchange, a third order screen exchange diagrams. And then the lowest order diagrams that allow you to couple spin up with spin down are those two. Because only in these diagrams do we have two different green function lines. For example, here we have this line, we have this line, and they are separate. So they can have two different spins. So this one could be spin up, this one could be spin down. Whereas in the, all the other diagrams, we have a green function running way, all the way through the diagram. And uh, they, as long as you do not have spin orbit coupling, we cannot have two different spins here. If we now compare these diagrams down here with the solution of the beta sub beta equation with this uh, um, letter diagrams, then we find out it's actually this diagram that should explain uh, the coupling of electrons and magnons. Because we have here this electron hole pair, which are coupled with the uh, screened Coulomb interaction. Uh, this is one of the diagrams of the letter uh, series that we obtain from the solution of the beta sub beta equation. And in order to get a self energy diagram, we have to close it here with another green function line. This other uh, diagram here rather explains higher energy scattering processes, which, for example, give rise to the 6 EV satellite of nickel, uh, but which we are not interested in at the moment. So what we define now this diagram to be the GT, what we call the GT self energy, because uh, this letter diagram here uh, is called uh, the T matrix. We Sorry. We use a subset there, not the full T matrix. Christoph, yeah. I have a question. But is it possible uh, to have uh, a diagram that coupled with the uh, spin excitation with just only two uh, interaction lines? So, for example, in, in the two uh, diagrams that you have shown, you remove yeah. the middle uh, interaction. Yeah. yeah. I'll come to that in two slides, I think. It's an interesting question, yes. I'll discuss that. Okay, um, so we do not only define this to be the GT self energy, but in order to take into account also collective excitation, it is known that we have to go to infinite order. So we take the fourth, fourth uh, rung ladder diagram, the fifth rung, and so on up to infinite order. So we actually do this. Huh? So we start on the third order, then fourth order, fifth order, and so on, up to infinite order. And if you look at it, it looks like, um, well, it's, 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 it's uh, the solution of uh, this kind of beta sub beta equation for the self energy. If you plug in uh, the T matrix here, then you create exactly this series of diagrams. Uh, I would say that similar T matrix approaches have been used in, in the framework of many body perturbation theory already, although it's, there are differences in the details. For example, by Springer, Arias, Setjavan, and Carlson, they mentioned this already, uh, treat uh, with this the 6 EV satellite in nickel. Um, also, Chukov, Chukov, Echenike, they uh, investigate the lifetime effects in nickel and iron. And uh, there is this uh, uh, publication by Romaniello, uh, which is a more theoretical approach where they discuss the uh, combination of uh, GW and the T matrix and apply it to the Hubbard dimer. And uh, there was also this recent publication 
a few weeks ago that I haven't had a look at it yet, I must say. Um, the difference between our approach and those approaches is that they are not fully double counting free. So you'd always need a double counting correction. And in our approach, this is double counting free because we use the, the Hedin's equations, we iterate the Hedin's equations. And let's say by definition, uh, this series does not have any double counting issues. I come now to the to the to uh, your question, Valerio. Namely, why do we not have this diagram? Uh, we take out from the third order the middle uh, interaction line, and this looks like a pretty decent um, a diagram. Now, if you ask this question to an expert of diagrammatics or condensed matter physics, then he might say, "Ah, but this is already included in GW." Yeah, and this sounds. Correct, because we have here an interaction interaction line, a bubble, another interaction line, and that is the first order of the W. But actually, if you look, we look at it more closely, um, this is already W. This is not the bare Coulomb interaction, that is already W, and this is another W line. So it's not quite correct, this answer. So what we could do is the following, we could take the first order of the W here and the zeroth order of the W uh, expansion here, then we would obtain this diagram. The dashed lines are the bare Coulomb interaction. Uh, but if we do it the other way around, we take the first order here and the zeroth order here, we get this diagram. But if you look at them, they're exactly, topologically, exactly the same diagrams. Uh, we get, because we have the bare Coulomb direction, bubble, bare Coulomb direction, bubble, bare Coulomb direction are the same here. But in this diagram, they would be counted twice. So this particular diagram is unphysical in itself. It contains double counting uh, errors. Uh, so that, that is the, the actual reason why it should not appear in the diagrammatic series. Uh, and of course, this diagram is of course already included in GW. Okay, um, how can we now perhaps more in, from, from a physical point of view understand the form of the GT self energy? And we can explain it in a similar way as GW. GW you can interpret in the following way. You have an incoming electron, which at some point emits a plasmon and later it, re it reabsorbs the plasmon and uh, propagates further. In the GT self energy, we have a similar situation. We have an incoming let's say spin up electron, which at one point here uh, emits a magnon. Now this magnon, which is just, uh, well, can be described by these letter diagrams, this, this magnon carries away a unit of spin. And therefore, in order to have spin conservation, the spin of the propagating particle has to flip. So we flip here from spin up to spin down. And once the magnon is reabsorbed, the propagating particle spin flips back from spin down to spin up. From these two diagrams, however, you also see that G the GT self energy is a more complex uh, diagram or probably more difficult to implement because in the GW self energy, we have only two internal integration variables that we have to integrate over the whole space and over the whole time or frequency. Whereas here we have four of these internal integration variables because we have this four point T matrix. Uh, three, four, five, six need to be integrated over the whole space. And then you can have also a little bit of fun with diagrams. Um, so let us have a look again at the GT diagram. And I've given you the interpretation already. Electron emits a magnon, absorbs a magnon. But this interpretation somehow relies on the fact that the times here are later than the times here. But of course, these are inner integration variables. So we could just as well take those and put them before here. 
what happens then? Then uh, somehow the, the magnon would be first absorbed and then emitted. That sounds like a causal problem. But of course, we can perfectly draw down the diagram. So how could we interpret this? We have a propagating spin up electron. It emits a magnon. The magnon travel backwards in time and the electron also travel backwards in time. And that's of course an absurd interpretation. No, the problem is in the interpretation. Well, of course, one could hope that such a, a diagram is just a zero if you do the math, but that is not so. This diagram is non-zero. It, it contributes to our calculations. No, the interpretation was wrong. So what happens is the following. You have a spin up electron which travels somewhere and then um, independently of this propagating electron, you have here the formation, spontaneous formation of two electron hole pairs. Now these things can happen in an interacting ground state. Yeah, these, have, these things happen all the time. You have a spontaneous creation of electron hole pairs and that is very similar to what you have in quantum field theory, uh, namely uh, the vacuum fluctuations. Uh, your spontaneous formations of electron positron pairs and in the condensed matter, these are electron hole pairs. Then uh, in this diagram, uh, it can happen that a hole and an electron are just in, in localized D states, they might form a magnon. And then this propagating electron simply um, uh, annihilates with a hole here, and there is a free electron which continues the propagation. Um, yeah, about the implementation. So how, what do we have to do? Now we know more or less what the cell's energy is. Uh, we have to solve the Dyson equation. And you saw the Dyson equation yesterday in Matteo Gatti's talk. And we solved the same Dyson equation here with our self-energy. But uh, we do that in a rather general way because as you've seen before, we need to take into account all the lifetime effects which is particularly important for this GWT approach, as I will show you later on. So uh, we do not calculate only the quasiparticle energies, we calculate the full spectral function. You saw this already, this uh, formula in uh, Matteo's talk yesterday. Uh, perhaps the difference is here that we take the trace of the green function and uh, use uh, the solution of that Dyson equation for the renormalized green function, then we get this matrix here and we use it really as a matrix. We do not uh, simplify it and, and make a diagonal matrix out of it, which proves to be important for iron, but I'm not going to talk about that. So those are matrices. Um, you very often, uh, or let's say in, in uh, most GW codes, you do another uh, further simplifications. Namely, you see this is a, an inverse matrix. Let's say this is a denominator. And where would you expect the peaks of the spectral function to be? They should be where the denominator becomes small or nearly zero. So if you um, put this expression here to zero, then you can define uh, this nonlinear simplified equation. And this is what most GW codes use, and also our code can use that particular equation to calculate the quasiparticle energies, which can further be simplified by uh, Taylor expanding the self energy up to linear order, and then you get this renormalization factor, I guess, that Matteo Giantomassi. Um, showed you these equations. But uh, in GWT, we cannot do that. Uh, it's crucial really to calculate the full spectral function. Before I show you the first result, let's discuss a little bit about um, what would we expect. Now, um, I think I have to speed up a little bit. Um, I think you saw this already before. So if you do a GW calculation for silicon, you get the occupied states here, which get nicely broadened the life, due to the lifetime effects. But you separate from the uh, bands, you also get these plasmon satellites. And they are just an effect of um, 
of many body excitations. So in DFT, we wouldn't get anything here. It would be just black. But in GW, we get something here. Uh, and we, one sees these uh, uh, plasmon satellite also in, in photo emission spectroscopy. Uh, but in GW, since plasmon energy is so, so large, uh, the two phenomena of um, quasi-particle bands and plasma satellites are nicely separated energetically. But for the GWT approach now, we take into account the magnons. And the magnons have a much lower energy. Um, so one would expect that the magnon uh, satellites would appear exactly in the same energy range as the quasi-particle bands. And it turns out that you get a very rich uh, renormalized band structure, and one cannot even tell anymore what is a satellite feature and what is a quasi-particle band. So that is the result, first result of a GWT calculation that I want to show you. This is for iron, spin up, spin down. In red, you can again see the DFT uh, calculation, and the color-coded plot shows you GWT. Uh, first of all, we see clearly that uh, we have profound uh, lifetime effects, so much so that uh, the, the bands that in DFT, we would have a band here, for example, it completely disappears in the GWT calculation. Also, this band here completely disappears. And that already explains the very strong um, spin asymmetry in the lifetimes, namely uh, the majority spins bands disappear soon below the Fermi energy, as we see here, for example, uh, whereas the spin down bands are visible to much larger binding energies. We can also explain this uh, physically. So suppose you have an incoming hole. This hole has a lot of opportunity to form um, a spin wave with electrons uh, in the spin down channel because of this particular form of the density of states. Whereas if you have a spin, spin down hole, you have much less uh, scattering space, let's say, or phase space to form a spin wave. And therefore the scattering is smaller on the right hand side than on the left hand side. Uh, when we did this calculation for the first time, I, I personally was, was uh, uh, very, um, um, yeah, cautious about the quality, but then I was extremely happy to see this comparison. That is a comparison with uh, dense, uh, dynamical mean field theory, uh, which is another method uh, that can treat strong correlations. And you see, it looks pretty similar. Uh, you have this band here, as particular, you have this very strong lifetime broadening down there. We have it also in DMFT. Uh, also, the spin down channel looks pretty much identical, but we also see differences. And that is where it gets now very interesting. So let's point out the differences. For example, this DFT band should actually cross the Fermi energy here. If we look at the GWT band structure, this band never crosses the Fermi energy. It stays below the Fermi energy all the way to the end point. And that is different from DMFT. DMFT uh, gives you this band here. There is another related issue, namely this particular band stays below the Fermi energy, whereas in DMFT, it crosses the Fermi energy as DFT does. Here's another difference. We clearly see a strong, relatively strong feature here across a particle band, whereas in DMFT, everything is completely washed out. Uh, the points are experimental points here. DMFT are just, DMFT is the color coded plot. It's, there is no feature here. And finally, interestingly, in this particular band, which doesn't show anything, um, um, uh, anything strange in the DMFT calculation, uh, we clearly see a gap opening uh, in the band. So the band stops to exist at some point and reappears at a higher energy and continues then. Very strange. So we have to talk about all of these differences now. 
And here I show you again the GWT self energy, uh, GWT calculation, a magnified picture together with um, uh, experimental points from photo emission spectroscopy. So, first of all, we see clearly that uh, this energy region here, there are no points. So, it seems this seems to um, uh, confirm that the quasi-particle bands are strongly suppressed due to lifetime broadening. So that, that description seems to be quite right. And also this band here, where DMFT shows you a band crossing the Fermi energy, uh, there is nothing in the experiment that would indicate the existence of this band. No, there is actually this point, which is below the Fermi energy, and the same here in the spin down channel that point here seems to confirm that this uh, band should be below the Fermi energy and should not cross uh, the Fermi energy. Um, this is also seen in other photo emission spectra, for example, this one. So if you had this band crossing the Fermi energy, one would expect a hole pocket here, but this hole pocket is simply not seen in experiment. Those lines come from DFT calculations, but the experiment does not see a whole pocket. So also here, uh, we, we clearly saw this um, uh, um, feature and there are a few experimental points which indicate that this feature should exist. And DMFT didn't have anything there. And now for this particular case, we do not have uh, experimental data, but we should have a closer look at it because it's so interesting that really a band ceases to exist and reappears at a higher energy. We assume that this comes from a strong interaction of electrons and magnons. Um, and in order to uh, prove that, we did a similar calculation just with the third order diagram, just the first uh, uh, diagram, uh, diagram of our self energy, and then this feature disappears. And that for us is a proof that this is really an interaction of electrons with extended spin waves because we need infinitely many letters to describe spin waves. And if we take out these many letters, then the uh, feature disappears. However, there is another band anomaly. Uh, that is seen in experiment and that we already also have in theory. And this is one in a spin down band of iron. You see the experiment here and you have already seen that in the motivation slide. You have the zigzag behavior of um, uh, this band. If you look at this part in the GW calculation, there is nothing. No band anomaly seen here. But in the GWT calculation, we do see a band anomaly. You see, it comes down, then makes a little curve, and then makes another curve. And this band anomaly just appears pretty much at the correct momentum and pretty much at the correct energy. Now, this energy is something that I've already mentioned before. Would we expect an electron magnon, an, uh, electron -magnon anomaly to appear at such a high uh, binding energy because the magnons are usually low energy excitations. And um, I will give you well, very briefly some information about that. So if you look at the GT self energy, this only, only at the frequency part of it, then uh, using the theorem of residues, we can uh, show that one would expect self energy uh, poles at the sum of a single particle energy and the magnon energy. And then we can simply take um, the uh, a peak in the density of states, which happens to be at 0 0.8 eV, and a peak in the magnetic response function. Uh, we see a partic particularly strong feature here. This is more or less at 0 0.7 eV. So the sum of the two is 1.5 eV. And perhaps an um, explanation for the fact that it is at such a high binding energy is simply because uh, this is an interaction of electrons and stoner excitations and not of magnons, which indeed are, cannot go very high in energy, but those can, higher, can go higher in energy. 
But still, this form of the band looks strange. Can we somehow explain uh, why would one get these band anomalies that are often called waterfall structures in photo emission spectra? And I want to explain this a little bit here. So suppose you have an electronic band. Uh, this is the momentum. This is the energy. In, uh, in the diagrams, we could uh, explain this band uh, as, let's say, a snapshot at this point. We have a single electron propagating, and this propagating electron has to be in some state, and a illus uh, graphical illustration of states is an electronic band. But we can also take the snapshot here. Yeah, and here we do not only have a propagating electron, but also a magnon. So this would at least involve three particles and perhaps many, many more particles because it's always the superposition of very many particles. So let's call this a many body band. We can also draw it in such a band structure because it has defined momentum and also an energy, which is a little bit broadened due to lifetime effects, but uh, we can draw such a band. And now something happens that I've already mentioned before, namely uh, these two bands can interact with each other. Although there are many body bands, there might be a coupling between them that creates uh, an avoided crossing, like you know from Bloch bands. And then we have these two bands. So the uh, quasi-particle band turns into a many body band and this many body band turns into a quasi-particle band. On the other hand, now we have to ask ourselves, would we see this at all? No, we would not see exactly that because we also have to take into account the green function, the numerator. So what we plot here is always uh, the poles, okay? But the weight of the poles is given by the corresponding numerator. And it turns out that the numerator of this particular combination of an electron and a magnon is nearly zero. And in a non-interacting system, it is exactly zero. Uh, in an interacting system, it is nearly zero. So these parts of the band structure are just invisible. And now we already have pretty much the form that we have seen before. We have a, 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 a band dispersing upwards, then ceases to exist, there is a gap and it reappears at a higher energy. And uh, usually uh, in this, um, along this line, we have a pole of the self energy. And whenever we have a pole in the self energy, we have a lot of lifetime effects. So uh, this part should also be blurred out by lifetime effects. And this is pretty much what we see in the theoretical calculation. We can also compare with uh, experiment again, because there is a way in experiment to extract self energy, the real part of the self energy and the imaginary part of the self energy. Here I only show the imaginary part of the self energy. Now we can compare our calculated self energy from what they obtain from this uh, analysis from the experimental spectrum. And uh, in blue, you see the GW curve. In green, this is the GWT curve, and in, in red, it's only GT, only, only the electron marker part. When we compare this to experiment, which are the symbols, we actually see a quite nice uh, agreement between theory and experiment, which, for example, GW could not explain. And finally, um, Perhaps I have to skip this. So here I wanted to say that um, if you look at the different uh, spectral functions coming from GWGT and GWT, it's quite interesting to see that uh, the different, uh, there are different energy ranges where one is dominant over the other. For example, around the Fermi energy is basically uh, the broadening is caused by GT. You, know, you just compare these two uh, diagrams, whereas at higher binding energies, rather these two diagrams uh, uh, agree with each other. 
Uh, there is another issue that I don't have to, time to talk about, namely a certain violation of causality here. Um, but uh, I just uh, skip this. Um, similar, we can uh, similar observation we have in the spin down spin channel. Yeah, and then up to now I have talked about uh, the spectral functions only in comparison with DMFT and experiment and seems to be, uh, we seem to find a pretty good agreement between, between theory and experiment. But of course, uh, if you introduce a new method, then the question is always perhaps if we improve one thing, we worsen another thing. And it is well known that uh, DFT, for example, gives a pretty good ex uh, uh, description of electron spin magnetic moments. This is the first table. Uh, the D bandwidth and the exchange splitting. And here we have compared these several uh, methods. I'm not going into too much detail about the numbers, but we have just the uh, LSDA here from DFT. GW, there are two GW values because uh, they are uh, done with two different starting points. This is GT, then GWT is in the great shaded area and the last column gives you the experimental result and I just want to show you uh, always the best comparison. So it's not so that GWT always wins but let's say it wins most of the time with some holes here but if we also take into account the second best agreement then those holes are also filled. So among these methods I would say that GWT describes these systems uh, the best way. And so with this, I would like to summarize. Um, so I've shown you that uh, we can calculate the many body spin excitations by a solution of the beta side beta equation. This has been implemented in this uh, FLAVW code. Um, this second point I did not discuss. Um, uh, the third point is the construction of the electron magnum self energy which we call GT self-energy. Uh, we have combined the GW self-energy with the GT self-energy, which we then call the GWT self-energy. Um, we saw that this gives rise to, to a strong uh, spin asymmetry of lifetime broadening in agreement with experiment. In particular, the majority D bands are strongly renormalized um, in such a way that the quasi-particle character is completely lost in some uh, regions of energy. Um, I've also discussed a few band anomalies, which comes from strong electron boson, boson being the magnon in this case, uh, electron magnon interactions. And one of these band anomalies have recently been seen in experiment. Uh, actually, at this point, I would like to point out that our calculation was actually a prediction. So we first did the calculation and then our colleagues from the experimental department saw this band anomaly and then they reinvestigated their experimental data and found the band anomaly just there. So that was uh, really a prediction. And uh, I've also shown you a comparison of the GWT band structure with DMFT and we, saw, we see that they are rather similar but there are also differences and uh, it seems that uh, GWT improves on these differences. And finally, I would like to acknowledge a few people. Uh, Dima Nabok um, calculated all these GWT spectral functions and analyzed them. Uh, Matthias Müller implemented the GT approximation in his uh, PhD thesis. And I would like to acknowledge fruitful discussions with uh, our boss, Stefan Lügel and um, uh, yeah, discussions also with our colleagues from the experimental department, Eva Blinchak and Lukas Fruczynski. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you for uh, a very nice overview and, uh, and for uh, taking us to these new dimensions in, uh, in the theory. And it was also very nice to, for uh, 
from you to point out all the similarities in terms of the GW and the pedestal Peter, so to make a connection to what uh, we have already seen in the during the school. And as you said, it was really a lot of information in the during the school, and uh, uh, we finish with this um, um, spin excitations. So first of all, questions. Um, Comments so, yeah, I, even? I think I, I missed a very basic point. So how do you break in the first place uh, the, the spin symmetry? I mean, this, you are discussing a fair amount, right? Uh, yes, I didn't quite understand the question. What, what is the question exactly? Uh, I mean, in the EFT, I mean, uh, how do you uh, break the... Uh, and from the uh, spin up, spin down symmetry, or I mean, ah, so I think what your question is how, how do I go uh, if I have a collinear system? How do I uh, perform these um, perturbations of the spin? Is this the question? No, I mean, that is kind of clear, but how do you uh, start with a spin up system, let's say, instead oh. of a spin down system? Oh, th this is just um, a DFT calculation. I mean, you can run the DFT calculation in such a way that uh, all spins point, ferromagnetically oriented spins point the positive Z direction or in the negative Z direction. So you kind of have to choose a number of bands which uh, spin up. Uh... No, it is, it is just uh, the solution of a self-consistent DFT calculation, including spins uh, of a collinear system, and uh, um, the, the self-consistent solution then gives you a ferromagnetic um, structure. Yeah. Okay, thanks. So, so we do not have to decide anything about orientation of spin. So it's it simply is a result of a DFT calculation. Yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a just a, what did you use and uh, spin uh, GGA spin result GGA or L LLDA? Yeah, yeah. LS in this case, it was LSDA. We could also use um, spin uh, GGA. Yeah, can change much, I guess. And, uh, and just to, uh, let's say just to make this point more precise, uh, what by just only using DFT, you can get in principle exactly and what, uh, uh, you, uh, what you need absolutely to go to many body approaches to, to get uh, uh, with respect to DFT. Well, in DFT, I, I've, already, I've always shown um, the GWT band structure, I call it just band structure, although it's rather spectral function. Uh, I always shown also here the DFT bands. In this particular case, it's LSDA. Um, and in order to get any lifetime information, you need to treat explicitly the electron electron interaction. So you have to go beyond DFT and do, um, for example, many body perturbation theory with GW or GW and GT, or you could also do it everything in an Anderson impurity model with DMFT. You also get lifetime effects. With respect, for example, to the last table that you have shown, could you point us what are the quantities that in principle you can get exactly from the FT and what you absolutely need to many body approach? Yeah, in, in DFT, you would get, um, I have to take the laser pointer, otherwise the cursor always hangs. Um, you would get the spin magnetic moments in principle, if you had the exact exchange correlation functional, you should get that also exact because the spin density is, a, um, is, a, is an exact, is known as an exact uh, functional of the density of the spin density. Uh, not crisis. Spin density is already the spin density. Yeah. Yeah. But uh, well, the D bandwidth we should not obtain exactly. Yeah. So, okay, in LSDA, we wouldn't expect the D bandwidth, even with the exact functional, we wouldn't expect the D bandwidth to be identical with the one measured in experiment. And also, the exchange splitting should not be uh, identical with experiment. Unless you 
um, consider the exchange splitting of the highest occupied state, uh, then, then it should be exact. Okay. But for the other of these states, it should not be exact. About the exchange splitting, uh, people using models, for example, the magnetic model, the Eisenman model, or evolution, are adjusting the, the exchange uh, term, the, the, the exchange, let's say, the, um, the parameter of the model by using exchange splitting coming from DFT. Yeah, this is a good point. Um, this is something that I didn't have time to talk about. So uh, perhaps very briefly, um, if you look at the spin wave dispersion, and these, these are just fitted points basically, uh, fitted to, these, to this uh, richer structure, uh, then we see that there is actually a gap error. And this gap arrow comes exactly from the fact that the LSDA green function is not accurate enough. Yeah? It's inconsistent with the beta sal beta equation. Actually, the spin wave should start at zero, but it starts at a finite energy. And uh, we can improve on that by using a more consistent green function, namely the COSEX green function, and then the gap arrow disappears. Uh, and what we, what we do, um, just perhaps out of laziness and or simply to simplify the calculation, is we use the LSDA green function, but we correct for the exchange splitting. This is a single parameter, and we correct it in such a way that this Goldstone condition is um, uh, exactly fulfilled, namely that the spin wave starts at uh, vanishing energies. And you see that the COSEX and the corrected LSDA spin wave are actually pretty much on top of each other. But it's not really a fitting or a free parameter that we introduce here. It's really a parameter that is fixed by an exact physical constraint. Okay. Okay, other... Uh... Questions? I don't see any, anything in the... No, no, the, the... Okay, yeah. yeah. It's one question from the experimental ones. So how, how is it measured, like, the band structure or, or a spin up and spin down? So there are some magnetic perturbation along with spectroscopic ones? Yeah, yeah. So, for example, uh, in this particular measurement, of course, they need to be able to assign the spin direction of certain bands from the experiment. What you see here, this is summed over spin up and spin down, but they also have the possibility to do a spin dependent photo emission spectroscopy. And then they can really assign uh, which band is spin up and which band is spin down. Usually the resolution is worse then, so that's why they, they show this one. Um, uh, but it is the resolu resolution is enough to decide to assign the different bands into spin up and spin down. Okay, and then the only way we take into account in the theory is by fixing the spin in the in the in our system that we want to simulate. No. Um, in the theory, well, the spin as of I'm not sure whether I understand the question well, but well, the spin of the bands is what we obtain from DFT. And then we do this many body correction. Yeah. Okay. And in this many body correction, we, we have all the spin uh, excitation scatterings. I'm not sure whether I understood the question. External, external magnetic field or let's say negative perturbations, they are taking into account in experiments we do not use it explicitly in the simulations. No. Ah, the external B field. Perhaps you are alluding to the beta sub beta equation where I always uh, consider the, an external B field. Yeah. Uh, now that, that is linear response theory where um, in order to derive the beta sub beta equation, you have to apply an external B field. But in the end, you take the limit of a vanishing B field. So we never actually have to explicitly um, impose uh, perturbation in the B field. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's like we do exactly for, uh, for 
Okay, for an external potential for the density charge. Yes, it's the same. It was already discussed uh, when uh, somebody mentioned what is this external field, uh, to point external field. Is a, a let's say, is a fictitious mm -hmm. uh, field to obtain some equations and then at the end to zero. Okay. Um, in the slide when we sh when you showed the theoretical expansion in terms of W. Um, so by performing the third order expansion, we obtain uh, two diagrams describing the scattering between the electronic magnets. Yes. Oh. So you're talking about this uh, uh, expansion? Yeah. So yeah. by performing the third order expansion in W, we obtain two diagrams. Uh, describing the electron magnum as scattering. Mm -hmm. So then your self energy becomes uh, GW, uh, GWT becomes GW self energy plus this two diagram, and you negate the other one. No, no, uh, just a second. Uh, this diagram plus this diagram, this one we don't treat because yeah. it's a physically a different scattering effect. But we also take into account then all higher orders. So we get the fourth order, fifth order, sixth order, up to infinite order. And these infinitely many diagrams we obtain by the solution of the beta sub beta equation that you see here. Oh. Yeah, if I if I if I understand that you 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 solve uh, let's say um, mathematically for uh, the T in this case, that, auto, that means that automatically all the orders are being taken into account, right? Yeah. yeah. Like, uh, when we have for the pedestal Peter that we shown L, we don't uh, expand L0 and then V affects L0 plus, but yeah. we respect the L and automatically we include all the orders. Is it the same, right? It's exactly the same, yeah. We don't actually calculate these diagrams individually we solve the um, uh, nonlinear beta cell beta equation, then as you say, we get all the diagrams automatically. Okay, and uh, since you are here and you get back one slide where you've shown exactly the, the diagrams that you uh, took, uh, since afterwards you mentioned uh, also the work of um, uh, Ferdi and Krista Carson, shouldn't be uh, the other one, ex exactly, it's, it's the other one, right? Yeah. yeah, it's the other one. Because it seems that here it's uh, either two electrons or two holes looking at the arrow. So it's uh, yeah. that's the satellite, right? The fixed EV satellite of nickel is exactly this uh, diagram. Uh, they also made further approximations like uh, putting the screen interaction as a parameter, a local parameter. So it's also some, uh, there are differences in the numerical approach. But exactly as you said, yes. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Who? Claudia, you have a question. Uh, well, okay, yes, yeah, I have a question. When you showed the bands that they were different within the MFT and GWT, uh, is due to the character of the bands, they come from the orbitals, uh, local at the orbital is in the uh, first question. And the second is uh, why the Okay, why well, there are a few points in the experiment? Why did the experiment they didn't do an ARP as much resolved? The iron should not be too complicated. That's my yeah, we, we took especially this experiment down here and we, we copied the points that they got from the paper. Um, yeah, I don't know at the moment why there are so few points at the moment. Uh, uh, we do have other um, photo emission spectra threads at some point. We should take the time to compare with other photo emission spectra that are perhaps more recent as well. Uh, the first question is a very interesting one. So the, between DMFT and DWT, why do we find the differences at all? So which of the t theories is, is better or worse? And uh, the answer to the, this question is the following. Um, how is it done in DMFT? Well, in DMFT, you solve the electron correlation in a single site. Yeah, this is very confined. How do you fit a full self a full spin wave into a single site? 
a spin wave is a spatially extended phenomenon. Yeah? If you put, if you force a spin wave into a single site, then rather of getting um, a small, a small resonance or sharp resonance that would, for example, create this anomaly here, you get a, um, a very washed out white peak, which could not give rise to such a feature here. So I would say it is in DMFT, it is really the restriction to a single site. But of course, DMFT can take into account many more diagrams than we can. But we, on the other hand, we do not have this restriction and uh, we have the full K dependence of the self energy. Okay. So, and uh, in, so how was uh, this dynamical mean feature in calculation done? They have used the usual Hubbard Hamiltonian with just only one new. So single band, uh, let's say, I don't know how many bands they used, but they, the, the, the model is the uh, simplest one, just only one U as interaction. Uh, I don't remember, so I think it was a flex calculation. So the impurity solver was flex, and I suppose they uh, took into account the D states. Okay, but I mean... Uh, with, with some, sorry about interrupting you, uh, with some U parameter, that they just take, oh, I think they fitted the U parameter in such a way that the agreement is maximized between theory and experiment. Yeah, but there is no, uh, uh, there is no physics uh, regarding the magnum in this model. Because if you just take, uh, so <coughs> you, somehow you uh, take into account by the U interaction, the electronic interaction term, you take into account uh, Somehow the renormalization coming also from magnetic excitation magnons. Uh, no, no, uh, the electron magnon interaction should be included in flex because you have the T matrix there. You have the T matrix and all spin channels are there. So the physics should be in DMFT. And about this, uh, this band that uh, arise in DFT and dynamic infrastructure, probably this band. Uh, was not uh, was taken at the level of EFT and uh, yeah. yeah 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 exactly so they take I mean they have to start their um, calculation somewhere and they use uh, DFT I think also LSDA in this case uh, but they can never get rid of this this band it's never suppressed below the Fermi energy and you need actually GW. Uh, this is not an effect of electron magnon. This is just an effect of GW. GW pushes this band below the Fermi energy and also this band below the Fermi energy. Okay. Okay, I don't see any other question not even in the chat. Okay, so, well, thank you. Thanks a lot, uh, Christophe, and, uh, and of course also to Claudio for intervening this, uh, uh, this morning. Uh, so this uh, concludes for the online uh, audience uh, the school. I hope that even if it was not at all the same thing, you could enjoy it uh, as well. And uh, now we have uh, this not so long pause, but still more than an hour pause, and we can reconvene at uh, at two for doing the last uh, the last zone on the on the pedestal Peter. Okay. Okay, bye, bye bye, and uh, well, see you in an hour.